have with us Barry Price. And um, I have a bio that I, I, I it's almost, I'm almost tempted to read it. <laughs> Barry considers himself almost a Georgetown native. He arrived here at the age of three. <laughs> I won't say what year that was, you could figure out his age, which happens to be the same age as mine. How were the 1940s? <laughs> I'll tell you if you'll tell me about the 30s. <laughs> I was born in August of 1949, and my wife, Cosley, who was born in the 50s, asked me, how were the 40s? <laughs> Some of you may remember him in the 70s and the 80s as uh, he began and operated the Mark Twain bookstore here in town on Front Street. Uh, Some of you may remember him in the 80s and 90s as the owner and broker in charge of Price Realty. In 2001, he returned uh, in, at the age of 52, now we figure it all out, he returned to college and earned three degrees in five years. And from there, a number of years, he taught history at Coastal Carolina University. He's contributed to the South Carolina Encyclopedia, Carolog, which is a publication of the South Carolina Historical Society, it's a very good publication, and the Journal of Supreme Court History. That I don't get. Um, I, don't, I don't subscribe to it. His master's thesis is what we're going to hear about today, uh, Under a Viral Seize, the 1918-1919 Influenza Pandemic in South Carolina. And I just I found it very interesting as we've announced this and put the publication out about this event, how many people's lives today were influenced or affected by that through family and friends who passed away back at that period of time. I lost a great uncle in 1918 in New Jersey as a part of that. So whom I never met, obviously, but join me in welcoming Barry Price. Well, you said that exactly the way I wanted you to. I'll give, I'll give you the $10 when the lecture's over with. I want to make a little bit of an apology before we start. I like to lecture in a linear way. I like to have things nice and neat, a particular time frame, particular people. Uh, here are the actors, here are the circumstances, here are the threats and the, and the opportunities, and here's the conclusion, and there's what we can learn from it. You can't do that with influence. Because after all, this is a, a historical lecture on science. No, well, well, hold it, but, well, not really. It, it's, uh, it's a historical lecture on military. It took place during the last of World War I. Well, hold it just a minute. It's, it's a worldwide conflagration. And it took place in South Carolina. And it took place in Georgetown. Mm. And we'll talk today about, uh, you want to hear about totals, numbers, big numbers? Now we believe, we know for sure, at least 50 million people died Good. in the war. 50 million. The number may be 100 million. But you know what, when it all comes down to it, we all have this habit of dying one at a time. We really do. The greatest dying time on the history of the world. More people died in the Black Death. Okay, I can see that. It took 300 years in Europe for it to happen. 300 years. Today we're going to talk about seven months. Seven months of how so many things are changed. And Bob, you mentioned this, and this is something I was going to bring up. I would like you to help me at the end of this. When things get a little close to the wrap-up time, I've asked Bob to let me know, give me five or six minutes, but then I want a period of time where if you have questions, you can ask them. But I'd also like you to keep in mind so many people, I interviewed so many people working on this, and so often somebody would say, well, no, I don't have any information in my records on that, but my great uncle in New Jersey died in the pandemic of 1918. And if you have a story like that and would like to share it with us, I would very much like to hear it from you. Now, let me, let me say at the offset that um, I'm not a scientist. I don't make any pretense about that. Uh, a lot of the science that I do know about the influence pandemic sort of just sort of flowed in by metamorphosis, reading a lot of books and a lot of studies and that sort of thing. Uh, anything I say concerning pure science, uh, I think I'm right, or I wouldn't say it, <laughs> but uh, you know, don't bet the farm on it. Be that as it may. Where did it come from? I need to, I'm, I'm, as, as I go through this process, I want you to understand I'm going to be a little bit chopped up because I'll talk a little bit about this thing happening and then I'll talk a little bit about the science. science of it. There are three terms that you don't need to remember, but they're called drift, shift, and reassortment. 
Influenza has been in all of us. I'm certain of that. And yet each year you hear about a new strain of influenza. Well, it's not a new strain at all. Sometimes it is, but usually it's not. It's just one of the old ones that's come back. But with influenza, there's a tendency of influenza to mutate. When it mutates a little bit, call it drift. When it mutates a whole lot, call it shift. Once in a while in a particularly in a duck or a human cell in your body, two influenza of different strains will come together and they'll, they'll swap genes. And when that happens, you've got something completely new. And we need to be very concerned about that. Usually we have, whatever we have when we have influenza, we usually have some degree of immunity because our body is going to be pretty quick about recognizing this is a threat and we need to do what we can to overcome it. Well, in 1918, the influenza changed. Now, it changes every year. Your, your flu shot this year is going to be different than your flu shot last year. And we know a lot more about it, of course, now. It goes without saying that we did then. But in 1918, the influenza changed rather drastically, but not terribly. And the people who got influenza were pretty sick, and a number of them died, as always happens. But it wasn't really that much more remarkable than any other season. This is in February, March, April of 1918. Over the summer, the influenza shifted again. Perhaps there was a reassortment. And we end up with something that most people have some immunity to. Most people didn't get the flu. Many people were exposed to the flu and had no symptoms whatsoever. So they had some degree of immunity but other people had none whatsoever and were totally at the mercy of the pandemic until their bodies could manufacture some sort of antibodies or other sorts of things. Some people thought it was caused by pigs in Iowa that had the flu. Some people remembered horses and mules who had died were being burned on a camp in Kansas. It's the fumes that caused the flu. The flu. That must be what it is. Some people said animal and human flesh. You ever heard of no man's land in World War I? Between the two sets of barbed wire, people would die out there and, and their bodies would be decaying out there for months. It must be that putrefaction and the, the fumes. The word malaria means bad air, by the way. That must be the bad air that caused the influenza. Other people are saying it's really just the displeasure of God. We don't know. But war is going on and we do not want the Germans to know how we are with our flu. The Germans are in the same bad shape we are. They don't want us to know. Spain is a neutral country, so we censor our news, as we should. The Germans censor their news. Spain doesn't censor their news. Did you hear about the? It's terrible in Spain. I just got a new newspaper from Madrid. Terrible. It becomes Spanish flu. They didn't deserve it, but they got it, and they kept it. But we see these things going on. Now, when you have this flu pandemic, it comes together, not just one thing, bam, here it is, but so many other things are coming together as they never had before. Tell me about World War I. Well, I'll tell you about trains. I'll tell you about steamships. I'll back up the 1850s. When we crawl on that wagon in Missouri and start heading for, for Oregon six months later, if we got there and half of us were still alive, it was a good trip. 1918, you could literally, sometimes, if you had a fast train, you could get on a train in San Francisco and be on the East Coast in three days, three and a half days. Usually it was five or six. Time had been compressed. And we had been compressed. We've got, got a lot of people in this room. We're going to be here very tightly for hours and hours and hours and hours. And while I'm breathing and you're breathing, we're exchanging air the whole time. And on ships, so many people are going to be crossing the Atlantic, particularly troop ships crossing the Atlantic. And we'll see the results of that as well. So that by the time we look at oh, September 1918 through the end of the war, yes it's a horrible war and yes there are many gas attacks and many people with machine gun wounds and artillery shells tear people apart. Far more people are dying of influenza than dying of anything related directly to the war. Well, in mid-August, by the way, a ship lands in New York, one person has the flu. No, hey, no charge, no point in getting alarmed, it's just the regular flu. So we see uh, a few days later there are more people in New York getting the flu. 
But meantime, in Massachusetts, there's something very dark happening. There's a place called Camp Devons, and soldiers there are getting sick. Two the first day, 12 the second day. By the time we become alarmed and the senior medical officer goes to Camp Devon to inspect the situation, he literally, by the time he gets to the morgue, when you open that door, that's the morgue, please walk in a very narrow, straight path because bodies are stacked up in the hall on both sides as you're walking down the hall. It really is that bad at Camp Devon. The time when travel has been reduced so much, with all that going on in Camp Devon four days later, we see it in Long Island. Four days after that, we see it in Virginia. And then after that, we see it in Camp Jackson. Today, it's Fort Jackson and, of course, Columbia, South Carolina. A very good uh, indication of how terrific the influenza is. It's found over in Georgia, just across the Savannah River at Camp Hancock. September 30th, two men come to the infirmary and are checked in for influenza. Two men. The next day, 716 men are in the infirmary. Three days after that, thousands are sick, 138 die one day, and that's really just the beginning. Really, just the beginning. We have war to fight, right? We have lots of other things to do as well. But you look immediately, the first week in October, and the shipyards in, in Jacksonville, Florida, are at two-thirds capacity. There are certain things you need, and certain things I need. But let me just tell you something. The officials in the Norfolk and Western Railroad are meeting in Roanoke, Virginia right now. We have 3,000 men out with the flu. How are we going to get those trains moved from point A to point B? I'm not finished. What's happening in September? The arrival of fall. With the arrival of fall, you look ahead three months, the arrival of winter in West Virginia and Kentucky and Southwest Virginia. 5,000 coal miners are out with the flu. I don't think we have enough coal to last unless we can get people down in the mines digging that coal. What are we going to do when your house gets cold as well as mine? All of these things are taking place as the Journal of the American Medical Association is declaring, listen up, it's just the same old flu. There's a magazine called Scientific American. I don't know if we get it here or not. Scientific American. It's just the same old flu. Just don't worry about it. And so many people are saying really and truly uh, exactly that. Don't worry about it. We see in South Carolina uh, people who will look at what's happening in Massachusetts and then New York and then Virginia, and I'm getting a little bit concerned. But I'm not, I'm not excited yet. And until the middle of October, a little place called Abbeville, South Carolina, a soldier stops off. It's a train station there. He's the first case of influenza in South Carolina, in Abbeville. First case. One. Two days later, two days later, every cotton mill in Newberry, South Carolina is shut down. Within a day or so, practically speaking, I can't say for every single one, but practically speaking, every other cotton mill in South Carolina is shut down. We come in here, we have a lot of humidity in the room. We're going to all be together for hours and hours and hours and hours breathing the same air. And we will see an opportunity with the windows closed for us to all take contagion. And the question begins, uh, you know, as a fellow executive with the, with, with the mill, I'm worried about our workers. But I'm worried about being able to continue working the, the mill. When will it be able to be open? And these things are going to get more and more serious as we see these particular things uh, uh, passing over time. As far as the military is concerned, as I mentioned, the training camps are terrible. We see by the 1st of October uh, in the Army, 14,000 new cases every day, 14,000. In America, not Europe, in America, 14,000 new cases a day. In the Navy, likewise, horrible statistics. As people will load up on these troop transports, very crowded, by the way, the Army and the Navy, uh, I won't say they don't trust each other, but they're very jealous of their own prerogatives. So you Army guys are going to go into the hole of the ship and you're going to stay there. We will not let you on deck for the whole trip. You can open up the portals during the day, but you have to close them at night so the German submarines can't see the light. And you'll be in there just as tight as can be, breathing each other's air over and over and over and over again. So what do we have on the ships? 
horrible contagion. One man recounted later being in a convoy, and the ship in front of me was a troop transport, and I stood on the bow of my ship one day and wept looking at that ship, because as we're going across the ocean toward France, I see the water splash, and then splash again, and again, and again. You're an officer. Your job on this ship is to record every death. Here's the book, a specific book to record deaths. Put down the man's name, rank, service number, the time he died, the day he died, and the exact time of day that he died. That's what you've got to do. And you look at this record, 215, 219, 227. Oh, there were two at 236. And it, there seems to be absolutely no end to it. But we have to figure out exactly how to, uh, how to deal with that. Well, how, what do you do when you have an outbreak of, of influenza? A lot of people have a lot of solutions. You need to wear a gauze mask. That really will help you prevent influenza. A doctor, two years later, they asked him about it in Chicago. What do you think about these masks everybody used? Did they do any good? You better believe they did good. You know the Cook County Jail? You ever heard of the Cook County Jail? Well, they got bars on the windows, and those bars keep out the flies very effectively. And those masks kept out the influenza just about as well. <laughs> now, if you really want to prevent the influenza, you need to have some asaphatic, a little, little pouch on your neck. Drink soda water and spew out the gas through your nose. This is getting a little bit yucky, but this is how you prevent the influenza. Pepsi Cola advertises that their soda water prevents uh, influenza. Someone warned you, if you want to prevent influenza, don't lick stamps. I was in class one day and somebody raised their hand and said, excuse me, what are you talking about licking stamps? <laughs> <laughs> Generation gap, right? Yeah. Don't lick stamps. <laughs> one of my favorites is, you need to put sulfur in your shoes and put a half dollar in your pocket. And at the end of the day, if the, if the half dollar has turned tarnished, that means the sulfur is working and you're not going to get influenza. We see all these sorts of things. Now, if you do have the flu, up in Conway, there's a, 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 a pharmacy called Norton's Drug Store. And uh, they're telling you they can't get most of the remedies that are commercial remedies, but they're making Norton's Tonic by the 100-gallon barrel full. And you can get yours. You see in, in newspapers and magazines advertisements of all kinds. Now, I'm here to help you. I have this tonic that I have developed and a shaman on the Andy, or on the Amazon River in South America gave me the formula and I have taken it upon myself to concoct this and I promise that this, this will prevent influenza and I'm only selling it for a dollar a bottle just to defer cost is the only reason and this is the best part if you get influenza after you've taken my time and if you die and if your wife will bring the bottle back, I will cheerfully withdraw her 50 cents or whatever the case may be. And, but people are paying attention to these sorts of things. And, and of course, none of them work. You see, two or three days after the beginning of influenza in America, cures all over the place. There's, I think there are three papers in Providence, Rhode Island. On one day, there were 30 cures for influenza in those three, three papers together. But all these things are... Uh, absolutely useless. In October, we will look back on September with fondness. You thought it was serious? Uh-uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. We see in October, the Citadel is going to close. The infirmary is full. 60 of the boys of the, what, 300, I guess, have influenza. We need to shut her down. The College of Charleston will close. They have been advised by all the hospitals in, in uh, Charleston, we can accept no patients of any kind whatsoever. You need to send your boys home. When I say boys, that's what they were then. And so they do. And your son gets uh, on the train in Charleston, a healthy, pale young man, and on the train all the way to Conway, contracts his balloon. First case in Horry County was exactly that, a cadet from the Citadel who um, contracted the influenza uh, on the train back home. There are some few schools, I want to give you a little heads up right now. Winthrop College 
and Lander College impose a strict quarantine. We're all going to be here and we're going to stay here. No one will leave for any reason. If you leave, you cannot come back in. And that way we'll keep the influence out. Lander, it wasn't so in January, but uh, uh, Winthrop is a really great uh, example of how these things can, can work out. We see um, restrictions in place by the 4th of October. There will be no assemblies except for the bond drive. We've got to raise money to fight the war. We're going to do that, so we're going to keep you safe over here for all these. You can't go to the theater. You can't go to church. Don't complain to me. You can't go to church. Um, we see George, George uh, Doyle, the first man in Georgetown to die. His funeral will be in front of the church. And we see also that um, uh, the, as these things are, are in, uh, in place, that, um, that um, businesses will have to close at 4 o'clock, except for pharmacies, and even then they can only sell drugs, prescriptions after 4 o'clock. People in Georgetown are dying as well as other places. Now I want to give you some examples in South Carolina. I'll jump around a little bit if I may. By October 9th, in Greenwood, every nurse at the local hospital is down with the flu. Mm -hmm. Grandville, October 16th, little town, small town, 600 people in a small town are infected. It's a quality of the flu that many people, when they are infected, have not the strength to get up and get a drink of water. When I tell you these people died of influenza, it is true they did. But in so many cases, uh, you see the head of the household is in bed, and the children with flu all die of dehydration, <coughs> something akin to it, because the parents literally do not have the strength to get up out of bed and take care of their children. We see Charleston divided into sectors. We see accounting a, a on the 10th of October. Five, I like this, this health officer because he's very frank. He said, we got 5,000 cases in Charleston. Those are the ones we counted. In Greenville, we see people going into the mill villages explaining to the workers what they need to do and not do to prevent the flu from becoming worse. In Rock Hill, the Red Cross will announce, yesterday we carried out 120 meals to all members of family who were unable to help themselves. Last night we made every possible effort to secure volunteers to attend families where death was imminent and not a soul was able to help the sufferers. They were compelled to tell six families in this condition we could do absolutely nothing for them. Only God knows how they managed to get through the night. Temporary hospitals, if you want to come, bring your own linens. In Columbia, 5,000 cases also are um, reported. And there's a congressman, his name is Lever from South Carolina, a very interesting guy. I'd like to know more about him. Who writes letters home to uh, to Columbia. There are 90 odd deaths here yesterday in Washington, 90 odd deaths with 1,500 or 1,600 new cases. Health authorities seem to think the worst is over, but I don't know why they have that opinion. I'm afraid to read my state papers because I note with them the deaths of so many friends. How are we going to bury the dead? It's very interesting that there are, in 1918, three companies in South Carolina that manufacture coffins. There are seven in North Carolina, North Carolina, and we will see people designated. You go to that city. You have the authority. You. You have the authority to shut down every industry in town, to make the people, if they want a paycheck, to go to the coffin company to make coffins so we'll be able to bury our dead. You see that all over. Uh, anybody ever have any Bassett furniture over the years? Mm -hmm. uh, the whole thing shut down. And everybody in that factory went to making coffins just as quick as they can, as they could. People are dying. It goes without saying. I want to mention something to you. In the midst of all this, there were about 750 doctors in South Carolina. About a third of them were off in bases and in Europe. So we had about 500 or maybe a few over 500 actually practicing in the state. Those people will work to the limits. And by the way, if you're exposed to the flu, multiple times, multiple days. So often you see that it's written the same way. He hasn't been out of his clothes for two weeks, if you can imagine that. Where do you get a nap? Where do you get a, a sandwich going through all this? And of course, after a while, eventually, you're going to have influenza. Probably. 
and very often the physicians would carry it home. So you begin to see, and I was looking at all the research I did with microfilm looking at newspapers, the doctors who died, and then they would say, Mrs. So-and-so, uh, the young wife of Dr. So-and-so, <coughs> or little Mary Jane So-and-so, the youngest daughter of Dr. So-and-so. These are things to, uh, to consider as far as how this influenza pandemic is going to uh, uh, affect things ultimately. With people unable to get up and, and tend to their children, with, uh, with uh, circumstances desperate, our circumstances in South Carolina were, of course, very sad. I must mention, if we go to Philadelphia for just a minute, let's see, what, what century is this? The 20th century we're talking about? Imagine, if you will, your grandmother. You loved her, didn't you? She took care of you when you were a child. So many good memories. Everybody in the home is sick with the flu. Your grandmother's taking a turn for the worse, and you're there with her holding her hand as she breathes her last. And so you cry, and you cover her in a sheet, and you wait. You wait by the front door with her body, and the next morning you can hear. 20th century, you hear. Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. And you stand up and you open the door and you look out. And there's a man standing in the middle of the street walking down. Behind him about, oh, 200 feet, is a big truck. Can you imagine how much you love that woman? And you pick her up tenderly, you wrap her in those sheets, you pick her up tenderly, and you walk down there. The man walks on by, but the truck pulls up. You see the man, by the way, when he sees you, he turns around and makes a signal. There's one over here at this house. The truck, there are two men, a driver and a guy riding on the running board. And that guy hops down. He doesn't even look at you. He doesn't even grunt. I'm sorry. No, we're beyond that. He takes Grandma with his hands to the back of the truck and literally heaves her body onto a pile of corpses. And as you stand there in the middle of the street with tears coming down your eyes, you can see the, the hands and the feet where rigor has set in. A hand reaching to the sky. And you realize there are 40 or 50 people on that truck already, and he's still taking more to the cemetery for mass burial. For mass burial. We will certainly see that in October people grow so weary. When will the terror end? And finally, as October yields to November, it does seem to slack up a bit. And people begin to talk about ending the quarantine. Hallelujah! We're going to get out again. We're going to have a chance to interact. This is all over. This is a terrible, terrible thing that happened, but it's, it's, it's going to be over in a few days. So we relieve the people. Y'all, we had a close one, but we're still here. Thank goodness you're still alive. And we relieve the people, and we all go to the movies. What happens immediately? It comes back. It comes back. And it's very interesting to me. Human nature is, is uh, I can never get enough of human nature. Finally, after several days, authorities are talking, you know what we're going to do? Everybody listen up. We're going to have to reinstitute the quarantine. And at midnight on Saturday night, there's going to be a quarantine. I just want to tell you, did you hear what I said, Mr. Arterville? Midnight Saturday night. And over here you have the theater on the marquee. This is it. This is the last show, double feature. <laughs> Saturday night. So the theater is packed with people because I, I want to go for who knows, a month more. I want to go and see the movies while I can. And we all go to the movies and have a wonderful time. And, uh, and while all that's going on, what are we doing? <coughs> We're shedding the influenza <coughs> uh, one another. We see Armistice Day, November the 11th. When in some places the, uh, the um, quarantine has been relaxed. So we're going to get out on Armistice Day and we'll be dancing in the streets all day. We, will, we have already had the fourth Liberty Loan bond drive where we have all been able to meet together. And we'll have dancing in the, uh, in the venues at night and give each other flu, uh, influenza uh, again. One thing I like to see are advertisements. Looking through the papers, how, how do you make money on influenza? Well, I don't want to be too obvious about this. But maybe I can make a little bit of money on it. I sell Victrola. Does everybody here know what a Victrola was, I guess? 
If you know how to lift the staff, you know how to make trouble. <laughs> I sell big trollers, and your children are going out in the street and playing with other children who are already infected. They're going to get influenza, bring it into your household, and whatever's going to happen to y'all, even death. But if you have a brand new big troller, you can shut the door, lock the door, keep your children inside, and play records, and probably be able to save the life, their lives. We'll see multiple, multiple, multiple ads for tonics and other things I've already gone over to um, prevent or to alleviate the effects of influenza. Some department stores are advertising underwear for ladies and children in particular. AT&T. Do not make a call unless it's absolutely necessary. You see that in every newspaper, the phone company has had an ad. Don't make, our, our operators, most of them are down with the flu. If it's an emergency, okay, but otherwise, please do not use your phone. South Carolina follows the lead of the New York Times. Are your wife and children protected? He was a victim of the same epidemic that is even now taking so many of our best citizens, I like that term, the best citizens, meaning that you probably are one of the upper chosen, if you will, there at this particular time, and you should do something about it. Um, we will see, let me see, I've got a note here somewhere, and I missed it, I went over it. We will see um, ads saying, for example, that if you uh, want to buy something, you can come while we're open, but you cannot take anything out on, um, on um, loan or on uh, approval because we will not do that while the influenza is, is going on. I lost a half a page here somewhere. We see um, another ad that I always like to make note of, and that is someone in um, Orangeburg, South Carolina. It's a really great, catchy ad. Today you are insurable, tomorrow you may be incurable. Perhaps you should do that. And it's very interesting. I, I saw an example of, um, within, the, within the insurance industry, there's, this, there's a real debate going on in the height of the, of the pandemic. Some people think we really need to bear down on these people and let them know they need to get insurance. We really need to do that. We'll increase our business and also <clears throat> make a few extra dollars. And then there are other people who are concerned that if we do this, what's going to happen in fact is that these people are going to <clears throat> are going to have the insurance, and when the crisis is over, they'll let the insurance policy lapse. So we don't want to be in um, in a business doing that sort of thing. So as we look for more and more things to happen, we see that people will be advocating the use of arsenic, quinine, aspirin. Hold it, just what do you call that aspirin? What's that number one aspirin? Bad. Yeah. German, right? Mm -hmm. You know the Germans might have put influenza in the aspirin. But people will be using aspirin, and we don't know it then, but uh, a lot of doctors are, are prescribing twice the maximum dosage of aspirin, which can cause uh, <coughs> the lungs to fill with fluid. That's not a good idea. We will see people who are affiliated with the mining and, and uh, processing of mercury, finding out, you know, all those people over there have influenza. None of our people have influenza. We'll see a doctor on in a war on a hospital. All these people in these, these hospital floors have influenza. The syphilitic ward, no influenza because they have some injection that has some sort of mercury uh, uh, property to it uh, as well. We will see uh, people advocating things like blood lead as well to get through, uh, to get through all this. And as, the, as our couple grinds on, things become even worse. In Durham, North Carolina, the Sales Cemetery lots is prohibited. We have dead and we don't have people to bury the dead. So if you want to be buried, you need to find some church in the country or some other place to, um, to bury. In Charleston, coffins are in short supply. I think I mentioned the nurse in France who was buried in a trunk. In Charleston, in some cases, we're burying people in packing crates. In Washington, D.C., there are people, if I may be presumptuous enough to say people like you and me, there are people who hijack a train because there are three train cars loaded with coffins. I don't mean to be mean. I know they need to be used somewhere else, but, you know, it was my, my dad died last night. My little girl died last night before last, and we want to bury them. And they literally, at gunpoint, hijack a train uh, with several, several of them. 
trainloads of, um, of, of coffins. We will see at Carolina. By the way, who's a Carolina graduate? Raise your hand. Tell me about it. You want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> Both. Both? I'll give you the bad news first. Okay. Clemson Carolina game. Carolina lost 39 to nothing. Why? When I went to Carolina, when we lost the game, it was a very clear statement. We outplayed them, but they outscored us. <laughs> <laughs> in 1918, so many of the Carolina boys had the influenza, they could not begin to, amount, uh, to, to mount an effective offense or defense, as the case may be. They lose a bunch of 39 and nothing. Write that in their book, too. Now, you want the good news. The next week, they won in the matchup against Davidson. Would you like to know why? The entire Davidson team was down with influenza. And they had to forfeit the game because they didn't show. <coughs> In the colleges of South Carolina, death visits. And death visits, very interestingly, the University of South Carolina. The, the college president wrote some wonderful letters to other presidents and other schools. One fellow remembered 50 years later. I was an undergraduate in 1918. And whoever his superior was put him in charge of the Woodrow Dormitory. Y'all, that's where I was when I was an undergraduate. But this Woodrow Dormitory becomes part of the influenza hospital system, if you will. And also, there was a building that was used for physical ed when I was there, and now it's an art center. I, well, I was talking <coughs> Green Temple. Anybody know what I'm talking about? At Green Street and oh, Sumter Street. Street. It's an Street. art center of some kind now. Um, but when you first get influenza, we'll put you there. And if the sun's shining and your temperature is under 100, we'll put you outside so you can get fresh air. That's probably a good idea. That's sunshine. When it gets over that, you go into the temple, and as the college president describes it, it looked like a battlefield. When you get worse than that, <coughs> they take you to Woodrow. And this is this guy who 50 years later talks about being at Woodrow. He was in charge of a whole group of students. Another guy was in charge of another whole group of students. That other guy, he smoked big black cigars for days, and he never got the flu. That must be what did. <laughs> As for me, I used Vicks Vapor Rub. I had Vicks up my nose all day long, and all my people I tended to, I had to do everything for them. I put Vicks up their nose every time I went by, <laughs> and that helped keep me from getting uh, yeah. influenza. <laughs> but the university eventually will lose half a dozen students. The Citadel and Charleston will lose half a dozen students. Um, Clemson loses, I think, two students, a professor, professor's wife, professor's child. Um, but these letters to other colleges are just so revealing of how horrible conditions were on campus. And at the, at the conclusion of, I think, uh, one of the University of South Carolina president's letters, he wrote all the particular colleges, um, Auburn, six deaths, Clemson, three deaths, Mississippi A&M, I guess that's Miss Mississippi State, 31 deaths, 31 students uh, had died there. <coughs> we see um, more and more cases of deaths in December. By the way, there's one very enlightening moment I'd like to share with you. Uh, we have a couple in Horry County. In the Long's community, the man's name was Long, uh, they had no children. They're at home. They hear a car pull up outside. They hear footsteps come up the steps and over the porch, goes around the side and opens a little side storage room, comes back around, they listen to the footsteps and knocks on the door. The man comes and opens the door. And there's a man walking down back to the, house, to the, to the car. And there's a woman sitting in the car. And the man said, we have brought something for you that we think you'd like very much. Please look in the storage shed on the side and you'll find what we're talking about. He ups in the car and they're gone. What's in the storage shed? Anybody want to guess? A baby. A baby. A baby. And yes, he was kept. I found evidence of him uh, in about 2000. He was in a nursing home. I think the same baby was in a nursing home. So they were able to have a child that they otherwise would not have had. It's a good story. Unfortunately, there are many, many other stories that go the other way. Also in Horry County, just north of town, is a family named Todd. Husband, wife, and five children. When flu came, Mrs. Todd did all she could do to keep out the flu. And in October, she did. 
There was another, after they released the, uh, uh, relaxed the quarantine, there was another outbreak in November. She still was assiduous in her efforts, and she was successful. December all through Christmas, no influence. January, somehow it got in the family. Five children. That's your legacy. On Wednesday, three die. I'm not picking. Mm -hmm. On Friday, the last two. What could you say to a person mm -hmm. who's been through that? Having given life to those children who age is about nine to seventeen, and now, and now they're all gone. As more and more we see with each wave, it seems when it when it begins to subside a little bit, maybe it's over. Maybe it is. We go from watching to concern to fear to panic to hope to maybe we should breathe a little relief back to more fear, concern, and panic as this thing makes its way through. And we'll see uh, more and more um, uh, restrictions again, whether church services will be allowed, whether movies will be allowed to open or not. In January, in some places in South Carolina, influenza in January is worse than it has ever been. In Baltimore, the prevalence of the disease is much more widespread than in the first attack. Trudy Bazemore is not here, is she? I don't think she'd mind if I name her particularly. But talking to Trudy, as I talked to so many librarians, well, Barry, by the way, I think it was her aunt. Uh, my aunt and uncle, or her great aunt and great uncle, uh, during the influenza pandemic, uh, there were brothers and sisters. There was a brother and a sister. They were both married. The sister had a little baby. Influenza came. The brother and sister both died, and the in-laws were left to deal with this by themselves. In time, they got together. And because of that, our family stayed intact, if you will. As far as <coughs> African Americans are concerned, and I want to talk about that extensively in just a minute, but it's reported George Wilkes in Chester County has lost six children uh, in January of 1919. And stay on that subject for just a minute. In Edgeville County, Senator Nicholson, who himself will be dead before it's all over, he writes the middle of January. This is the middle of January, and I'm assuming his numbers are correct. So far, no whites in this community have died in 1919 from the disease. But the mortality among Negroes has been very great. 60 coffins by actual count have been carried from town since January 1st. Why? The state health officer will write the governor, and this is in January. As you know, the State Board of Health has no money from January 1st to March 1st. Consequently, we can give no aid. Additionally, the Red Cross has no funds. The federal health officer writes, very near as many people are being infected as before. The U.S. Public Health Service and the American Red Cross gave 30 doctors and 40 nurses to South Carolina during October and November 1918. Both were requested to assist again, but both have assured me that funds are not available for this purpose at this time. Without adequate personnel, I can do nothing. So how do we end it? How do we look at all the deaths and make some sense of what's going on? A big part of what I taught in school was the lessons of history. We can learn for the sake of jeopardy, or we can learn and try to make some sense of something. It was a very interesting article I liked very much, written in North Carolina, called Blessing in Disguise. They discussed the blessing of the influenza pandemic. Yes, it was horrible. Yes, a lot of people died. But the blessing of it in that we realize now that we really are in the 20th century. We really must conform to the circumstances we find ourselves in. And as a result of this, by the way, not just here, but nationwide, you begin to see more and more affected the rise of county health departments, the rise of state health departments. And I've got an idea. Let's give them the authority to demand things be done when your life depends on it. This is really a, a legacy of the influenza pandemic of, of 1918 and 1919. Dr. Green, who was the medical officer in Charleston County that I alluded to before a couple of times, he was very um, useful to me. 
and looking at the circumstances of county. And he would often recite, we have this many thousand cases in Charleston, and he would, oh, inevitably, he would say, these are the ones we've counted so far. When it was all over, in his final report, he said, during the recently concluded pandemic, Charleston County, 15 to 18,000 cases. Again, those were the ones that were counted. And then he said, the number was probably twice that. Probably twice that. Well, how many people died? I told you, worldwide, 50 million, perhaps as many as 100 million. How many died in South Carolina? Was it 3,600? That's one number. Was it 10,000? That's another number. My guess, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this, my guess is 15,000. There were just so many that were undercounted. And to talk for just a little bit about that question, if we have undercounted, then we have not really been made aware of the full ramifications of the danger we were in. Let's take it a step further. We were in, and we may be in again if we don't learn from this mistake. When I was in graduate school, I wrote a paper before I did my thesis on influenza. I was taking a class in, in uh, medical history. And every week we would talk about tuberculosis or influenza or polio or some other particular disease. And uh, we had to do a rather substantial paper as part of our course requirements. And I chose influenza. I ended up going to the library checking out a bunch, a bunch of books. <coughs> there was this guy by the name of Albert Crosby who wrote a magnificent book on influenza. I loved it. There was one paragraph in that book that just did not sit right with me. I couldn't figure it out. And I said to myself, you know, it might be something good to find out. Is he really right about that? Or did he make an error? And somewhere in that book, that paragraph basically says, I'll paraphrase it a little bit right now, but it basically says, um, in the influenza pandemic, white people died at a greater rate than black people. In all of the American experience with medicine, this is the only time this has ever happened. And I have no idea why it happened. And I said to myself, hmm, was he right or not? I decided to find out if he was right or not. And so I began researching the question. And I ended up, as, this is a long story, I'll try to make it as brief as I can. I was, I was writing on something else on influenza. And I was in a, a particular library. And I was looking for deaths of, of soldiers in World War I, particularly from influenza. And I went to the shelf and I was just running my finger along looking at the different books in the reference section. And I came across this green book, Service Records of South Carolina Soldiers in World War I. I looked at it. Wow. First of all, in the front of it, you got my county, the list of every soldier from each county, every Georgetown County soldier listed. Another really great part is, beside the ones who died, is a cross. So I can look and see who died and who didn't. Look at the back of it, and there's the guy's service record. Alphabetical. When he went in, where he was from, the battles he was in, the decorations he received, when he was discharged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I spent a good couple of hours going through this book, finding people from several counties that had died, people that had the information I was looking for. And I was very proud of myself, and I put, took the book and got ready to go put it back on the shelf. It had been published in 1920. So I was very careful with it. Got ready to put it back on the shelf, and there was another book just like it beside where I was. Five minutes where I was. I looked at that book. I put the two books side by side, and then I realized something. The first book was a book of the white servicemen. The second book was a book of the colored servicemen. This is the way they were called. The colored servicemen of World War I. Hmm. Suppose I compare the two. Suppose I compare the county, Georgetown County, the white soldiers, the black soldiers. What percent of the white soldiers died in October, just October, because you got to have a specific time. Uh, October 1918 died of influenza or pneumonia, which was usually the cause of death, followed the, the influenza. And what about the black soldiers? What about the death rates for those soldiers? They should have gotten care that was essentially the same. You all agree, if you've ever been in the service, and if you got the sniffles on June 13, 1964, there's a record of it somewhere. 
So all these records are there in that book. In those two books, I should say. And I found out something. In the Army and the Navy, the black soldiers died much more often than the white ones. But Georgetown County, and for Ulrich County, and for Orangeburg County, and for Aiken County, and for Richland County, and for Charleston County, and for a couple of them. Wow, got something going on here. There was also in the newspapers of the state, all over the state, in the latter part of November was a, a recapitulation of the deaths in South Carolina in October only by county, <coughs> by race. So I was able to take the census of the, of the um, people who lived in a given county, whether they were black or whether they were white. I had access to that. The people who are in the community probably had less health care than people who are in a hospital having care on some army base somewhere. And I found that in the reporting in South Carolina, the numbers were completely skewed compared to the military reporting. And in every case, black people died more than white people. And I also found something else very interesting. In rural areas, whether you're white or black, you died much more frequently than you died, were recorded, I should say recorded, uh, than uh, in, the, uh, in the urban areas. Much more frequently in, in the rural than in the urban. In fact, the African American in the rural community died at a rate of about three and a half times as often as whites in the urban community. Now, there are lots of ways to manipulate all these figures, but the point is that I, I believe that the death toll was undercounted by about 5,000 people, just, just looking at that. And when you look at that from that point of view, uh, and you loft that, and I cannot loft it beyond the borders of South Carolina, but if it can be, what the numbers must be. If you look at the little that was written about the influenza pandemic afterwards, up until about 1990, you always see the figure 22 million. 22 million people died worldwide. You can see the number every time, 22 million. It began to change after about 1990. And there was one demographer in Britain that came up with 21.6 million, and they lofted it up to 22 million. That's where it came from. Uh, and everybody assumed that must be so. But if you really look at his data, Here's a particular country where the people died, and he puts a little note in there, this is just a shot in the dark. Wow, how, how reliable is that? <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, it gave me a lot of a pleasure to see that maybe there's one little piece of history that wasn't known that I was able to, uh, I was able to locate. One last thing, before, and we'll wrap it up in just a minute. Give me one, one quick second. Uh, can this thing happen again? Can it happen? We're, listen, we're in the 21st century. Have we learned more about medicine than we knew in 100 years ago? Yeah, we know a lot more about it. <laughs> Can it happen again? You better believe it will. You better believe it will. Let me tell you something. It comes from pigs, birds, people. This is a, a virus that goes from one animal to another. And when it will make its mutation in a bird, <laughs> birds are a repository. So most birds have influenza all their lives, but they've never had any symptoms of it. But it starts making a genetic change. And it's very hard for a virus to go from a bird to a human. But if it does, and if it will mutate in that human, it may become easy. It's very hard to, to go from a human to another human. But if it will make a mutation, it may become very easy for it to go from a human to another human. That's where the real danger is. You take a place like China that is always, may I use this word, lying about what's happening in China. This is a place where people are in intimate contact with their animals. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying that this is a fact. If you look at China in 1968, look at China now. For every pig in China in 1968, there are now a thousand pigs. Wow. For every chicken and duck in China in 1968, there are now a thousand chickens and ducks. And if you have these people who are in close proximity every day for hours to these animals, you can see where some of them sometime will pick this up. And by the way, I will just warn you that when it happens, and we don't know it's happened. CDC does a good job, by the way, in Atlanta. But when it happens, and we don't know it happens, you got on an airplane in Hong Kong. Your cruise ship landed and you're taking the plane back. You get on the airplane in Hong Kong. 
And how long does it take to go from Hong Kong to San Francisco? You know, it's 12 hours or whatever it is. 300 other people. They don't like to put new air in the airplane at 30,000 feet. It's got heated up and it's real thin anyway. And so they like for you to breathe the same air the whole way. And you are breathing the same air I'm breathing and I'm breathing the same air he and she are breathing. And when we landed in San Francisco, you had been infected, this one person was infected two days ago, and feels fine. But it has developed to the point that now that person is feeling fine and shedding the virus. So we 300 get off the airplane in San Francisco, have a good flight back to Seattle, nice to see you, hope you have a good trip back to New York, same trip to Florida, and we disperse. And we feel great for two days or three. Maybe you're taking more airplanes and you will in time be infected with other people. It will come, it came upon us so quick in 1918 because of all this travel and people being packed together. Look at us now. Do we travel more? You better believe it. Much more widely than we did then. And also people still, that we are today, right? Packed together. Uh, I woke up with the sniffles this morning, but my wife said, you better not say anything about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said anything about that. But, um, but I believe it truly can. And although we have all these changes and advances in medicines, we have antibiotics, you better be sure they occur. You better be sure there's enough, hold it, for the world. Because I'll tell you something, France is going to be screaming if we get it and they don't. You better be sure of vaccines. You better be sure we have enough. All the other countries will be screaming for it if we don't. A lot of people for years put faith in something called Tamiflu. You ever heard of Tamiflu? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we're already seeing signs of flu becoming resist resistant to Tamiflu because so much of it's been flushed into the water and the ducks in their feeding have picked up the Tamiflu. Tamiflu is in the ducks' bodies. The virus in the ducks' bodies is developing a resistance to Tamiflu. When it, I'll say it this way. When it works, will it save your life? And I also want to point my finger at you and say, are you willing to bet your life that is the case? We had better be vigilant, and if it comes back again, we better take all, mess, all uh, methods necessary to try to keep us, ourselves alive uh, until it's over with again. It has happened in the past. Every scholar you look at that has looked at this will tell you it is going to happen again. Y'all are a good, good audience. One out my welcome. Welcome. Who has a question? Yes, ma'am. I don't remember exactly how many years ago, but I think it was around 2014, maybe 2015, when we had a, a serious <coughs> strain of flu. And if I'm remembering correctly, it was identified as F19 or something that had a 9 wow. in it. Yeah. And we had more people in South Carolina to come down with the flu than was was average for us. Did they ever identify the strain of flu that, that I, occurred I think, in I think it was H1N9. With that 9. I think so. The, it, 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 this is getting a little technical, but when you look at the numbers, the H has to do with the, with the actual structure of the exterior of the virus, and the N has to do with the interior of the virus, and how the virus is therefore able to function. Uh, but you can have all sorts of variations. The 1918 was H1N1, was the one in strain A um, in 1918. By the way, I talked before about China and pigs and, and uh, birds and all that. It was about 1904 when there was a real fear, and they called it swine flu. It had nothing to do with swines, but a lot of people are banning swines while this is going on. But in China in 19, I think it was 19, 2004, uh, in China they killed 100 million chickens and ducks to keep it from getting out. A hundred million. Uh, I could say something stupid like that's a lot of chickens and ducks, right? <laughs> that's a lot of chickens and ducks. But it was worth it to keep it from getting out into the, uh, the human population. And it very well could have with all the, with all the, all of them there, they're all exchanging influenza viruses as well, but the animals are among themselves and then people can pick it up. Uh, and it, it's, the, it's the idea, what really is the real target of all this is how easy is it for the virus to leave that animal, go to the human, to spend its time in this human and then be successfully cast out, shed to other humans and take it in. 
That's what's so very deadly about it. Particularly strange, our, our, uh, let me just say this also, that uh, we do have multiple immunities or partial immunities to influenza. We've been exposed to so many varieties of, of, uh, of, um, of flu. But in the 1930s, the electron microscope was invented. It's the first time they ever saw the virus, ever. What year was that? In the 1930s. And um, they also, about that time, developed a test to find out if your body, I suppose they're called antibodies, if your body had antibodies to resist the strain from 1918. And they tested about 140 people. Every human being tested who had been alive in 1918, every one of them had the antibodies. So something kept them from getting that problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What kept the white people in rural areas from getting the influenza? They did get influenza. They did. The question was, um, why did they get it more than the whites in, in, in reality? Why did they have it more often than the whites in the cities? And why did the numbers say the whites of the cities had it more often than the whites in the rural areas? And I, I, I do need to take one second, if I may, to just cover that. And that is the counting of the dead. If you're in the city, and for example, I drop down <coughs> over here, the doctor, well, the doctor's sorry that I'm gone and he's going to comfort my wife for a minute, and, but then he's going to fill out a death certificate. What about in the country? First of all, the doctor, uh, he's somewhere about six or eight miles down the road. Is he ever going to get back here? I don't know. And by the way, uh, we've had death certificates for three years. What, what's the good of death certificates? Well, I don't really know if it's any good or not. No, maybe. Grandma's dead. There's the family cemetery. So we'll all weep. We'll read a verse from the Bible. We'll bury Grandma next to Grandpa. And we'll go on with life. So we don't have a death certificate. So often you see this, and particularly in a rural area. No death, and this is what I'm talking about. No death certificates. The African-American man I told you who lost six children I looked up the death certificates and I found five of them. The sixth one was not there. It wasn't there. Other people, a multitude of people have told me, by the way, grandma, so and so and so and so, there's no death certificate. Uh, people who know how to look up death certificates know that they, their particular ancestors don't have a death certificate. Once again, thank you all very much. All right, thank you.